Every town has its legends. Every neighborhood has its boogeyman. A killer with a hook for a hand. The drifter who snatches children. The witch who lives in the woods. Why are you here tonight? You hear stories, you just want to see what it's about, I guess. What do you guys expect to find out here? People who died here are supposed to be the ghosts. Do you believe that they're devil worshippers? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Do you think every urban legend has truth behind it? Yes, I think you have to have some form of like truth to gonna go off of. A truth that is often more terrifying than any fiction. An old legend that actually happened this time. Many more cases of contaminated treats. I know she suffered a lot. He pulled a knife and tied me up with electrical tape. I almost destroyed you to see something like that. A random crazy man, lunatic. Taking a scary story and literally making it true. Today they found the bodies of at least three young boys buried under his house. For Rachel and I, this is an attempt to uncover the truth behind our urban legends. <gasps> oh my god, that's the cord around her neck. As we pull back the curtain on what it is we all fear. Do you believe that really happened? Yeah, and she was holding on like for dear life to the fans. People had theories and all kinds of rumors had been bouncing around. So many people believed the fiction and the fiction became reality. Legends last for a long time. Look at that line, son of a mm -hmm. bitch. You don't trust nobody. Can't. Because urban legends, as scary as they may be, are really just warnings for something much more dangerous. The reality that may have started it all. We're here speaking to Joshua Zeman, who is director of Killer Legends. Josh, thanks for joining us all the way over the pond. No problem, my pleasure. I just wonder if you could give us a description of Killer Legends. Uh, sure, Killer Legends uh, basically is an anthology uh, pilot that we did for Chiller that looks at the intersections between true crime and urban legends, and kind of how uh, these stories keep seeking in, seeping into our like collective consciousness, and you know, keep building upon each other and building upon each other. So it's you know very interesting. Uh, when I did Cropsey, that was an urban legend come true in our hometown about an escaped mental patient, theoretically, who was snatching children. And it didn't turn out to be an escaped mental patient, but there was this guy snatching children. And there's always urban legends about mental institutions. Uh, it's very popular. And so we kind of took that idea. Uh, Chiller approached us and said, hey, do you want to do something about some other urban legends? And, and the, you know, is there any truth behind them? And, you know, that's the whole interesting thing about urban legends. For an urban legend to form, there has to be some kernel of truth behind it and then some kind of mystery. And so that's what we explored in this show. How did you choose which legends to go after, basically? Um... I think we started back with some older ones, <clears throat> you know, definitely some uh, <clears throat> that were very popular in American culture, also ones that had uh, a very interesting narrative that we could explore. You know, uh, since the 1950s, one of the most popular has been uh, the killer with a hook for a hand, a couple making out in the front seat of their car, and uh, they hear something over the radio that there's a killer in the area he's escaped from mental patient, mental institution or prison and you know go home and the girl's like oh I want to go home uh, the guy coitus interrupts us the guy's very upset he doesn't get to have sex and then he goes and drops the girl off and sees <clears throat> on her door handle the hook and so you know they were minutes away from getting killed and that one you know is really interesting what's so interesting about it is it was one of the most popular in the 1950s and 60s with the explosion of the American car culture scene, uh, kids making out. And then, you know, it logically makes sense that where you're going to have kids who are in a very, like, kind of abandoned, far-off place making out, and that if you're going to have, like, a rapist or, or a serial killer rapist, like, they're going to go to that spot to do it. So it's only going to make sense. And then <clears throat> we found out that that connected back to 
uh, the Moonlight Murders in Texarkana, Texas. Four couples killed in the front seat of their car, making out in lovers' lanes. And then the, what really sealed the deal on that one was Charles B. Pierce's uh, famous The Town That Dreaded Sunday, which was a 1970s film. A lot of your fans probably know about it. One of the first, like, docudrama films, you know? And what, what blew my mind in a great way was that the town of Texarkana, Texas, where these crimes happen, where this guy made this film in the 1970s, they show the film every year in a park where the murders happen as some kind of homage. And I love it. I and mean, to me, that's because what that really is to folklorists. It's called legend tripping. It's where you go back and you reenact the scene of the crime and kind of be like, oh my God, this is so crazy. This is where the killer stood and all this stuff. And literally the whole town is doing it. And <clears throat> I, I think it was a brilliant idea. I'm, it, for me, it's quite progressive for a, you know, backwards Texarkana town, you know, that's very conservative, but somebody had a great idea there. And from that, there's this new movie you know, the remake of The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And the remake is about the screening that happens. So it's totally meta on top of urban legend. And so, like, you had to do it. It was just, it was just amazing. It's totally cool. So that was, that's one of them. And then, uh, obviously, Halloween candy, the idea that, you know, there's what's called the Halloween sadist out there poisoning children, but there's ever only been one documented case of a child ever being seriously injured or killed. And this is this case that kind of made the urban legend, and that's called extension. There is uh, uh, babysitters. You know, the babysitter has always been, you know, the, the victim du jour for many years. And then, of course, Ty West's House of the Devil only kind of like adds to that urban legend on top of urban legend. And then clowns, creepy clowns. When did clowns become so creepy? And obviously, for the kids today, I don't think they've ever seen clowns as being innocent. You know, the pendulum has swung to the such the other side that, you know, what happened? <laughs> and then, of course, you know, the penultimate killer clown to me is the Joker. And then the way in which culture has perpetuated even the urban legend of the Joker with Heath Ledger, with this guy James Holmes in America shooting up uh, The Dark Knight Returns, you know, saying he is the Joker, the Joker being the ultimate uh, destroyer and, and creator of chaos. And, and the clown is, in so many reflections, the, the flip side of culture. You know, this flip side of, of everything that's great and happy and, you know, beneath the mask, beneath the, you know, face paint is, you know, typically a killer pedophile. So, <laughs> so there you have it. They're the four ones that you focus on. How long did it take you to do research into them? How long were you before you actually kicked into gear and started going off to these places? Uh, about a year. I mean, we always... I had done a pretty lengthy tour with Cropsey, and so the idea... And, and visited all these towns, and so every town I went to, kids would raise their hand and be like, oh, we have an urban legend that we'd like to discuss, and, you know, that our town. You know, and I, I was like, dude, let's do it. You know, and so... You know, it was always that interesting thing. It was interesting, you know, a little bit of insider Hollywood baseball here. When we were pitching it around to all the networks, we're like, we're doing a show about the crossover between urban legend and true crime, about stories you know that, like, affect you and scare you here, you know, rather than, like, ghost hunting, you know. And all the network executives were like, wait, so you're not searching for ghosts. Well, then what's scary about it? I was like... Forget it. <laughs> I just don't, totally don't get it. You know, like these are these are these are stories which have been around for fifty, sixty years, and even further that we've kind of continually regurgitated in our culture. But never, you know, they're there. They're part of our Jungian collective consciousness. And then, you know, of course we were going to do the Slender Man, but we didn't have a real crime with which to connect that to, and now we do. Um, so it's just. You know, even Slender Man, you know, the idea that it's just an amalgamation of stories that have been going on for hundreds of years. German urban legends, you know, urban legends about pedophiles being strung up, and that's why their arms and legs are so long. But of course, this is tailor made for the internet. You know, the idea that we 
no longer tell, I can no longer tell you the story. Just because I tell you the story doesn't mean you believe it. What I now do is show you photos. And in a new internet world where, where like, we need different levels of proof, it's now about manipulated photos. And, and that's, that's the new story, you know, around the digital campfire of the internet. You were talking about the networks and saying what's scary about it. Is it difficult for you, when you went out there to, to pitch it, to say, we're not doing these ghost hunter things, we're actually going further and further into the history books? I mean, how difficult was it for you to explain this to them? It was really, you know, they're always, you know, we're always, networks are always behind, <laughs> you know, of, of what really is happening. And of, of course, I think with Cropsey, which was a, a little bit ahead, you know, in terms of like, okay, this is not ghost, you know, this is, you want to see something really scary? How about some 1970s footage of mental institutions, overcrowded mental institutions? That shit is scary, you know? And, and so it was kind of the anti-found footage movie, you know, we were taking real footage and, and laying it out in a narrative way, rather than taking fake footage and trying to make it seem like documentary. It's almost like the reverse Blair Witch. And so, I think... I, I think, you know, they're a little behind and they're like, wait, we don't get it. You know, well, uh, you know, yes, I see Cropsey, but that's one story, but how does this pertain to other stories? And, you know, urban legends, it's, it's a tough thing. You know, it's a tough thing to explain. It's a, it's a tough thing to say, why does this idea of this guy in the woods freak me out so badly? Why, why, do, why do the mentally ill freak me out so badly? And of course, when you talk to folklorists, it becomes innately obvious why does the mentally ill freak us out? Because we can't really tell a discernible difference between them and us. You know, there's a very small line that we can cross. We all have this innate fear that one day we're going to wake up and be crazy and maybe kill children or our parents or something. And so, you know, we're always like, am I going crazy? And so it's, it's very innate and it's very real and, and tangible. There's, um, you were talking about going crazy and whatnot. There, there's a brilliant scene in the in the documentary that I love, where you want to go and knock on this person's door, and obviously you're uh, and Rachel kind of stops you, yeah. But then you still go off and knock on the door and say to her, "Hey, did you know these killings happened and everything like that?" I mean, is that how your dynamic works between yourself and and your colleague? It's interesting. I think I, I've been researching the urban legend stuff for many more years, so I think she's a little bit of the tourist character, you know, in term, and I'm a little bit, you know, we got a lot of flack for that scene, and it was very interesting because we obviously knew that it's somewhat dangerous territory to go knock on some door and tell somebody that, you know, a crime has happened here. And, and, and when people watched it, they didn't quite understand that we were making a comment on it by showing the characters kind of debating the the, you know, the ethical issues of telling somebody that someone died in their house. Um, and so I think they thought that that was really me. Uh, but that's not really, really me. It's more about sh showing how documentarians and people struggle with these decisions. At the same time, it was very interesting because when we did go to the door and knocked on it, it was an old woman. I'm like, oh, okay, we're not going to do this to this old woman. You know? But she's like, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. You know, she was totally into it. So... It was just very interesting, but I like to talk about, it's not just the, the creepy things, it's also, as a documentarian, and I see it with all these kind of like, you know, shows about documentarians, about people going out making movie, movies and found footage, like, I like the inherent real issues that are there, and so, everybody's like, oh, he's office, how can he go out and like, you know, tell people that this happened, I was like, as to comment on the, on the issue, not actually doing the issue. But yeah, that is our dynamic. That's, you know, it's interesting. It, it's definitely a little bit of a, a Scully, you know, and Mulder type of, you know, but that's real. You know, when we were making Cropsy, uh, I believed Andre Ran at one point was very guilty, and my partner didn't believe he was guilty. And as we went through the evidence, interestingly enough, our opinion shifted. And, and it's what happens when you go down the rabbit hole of any story about conspiracy, you know, you just can't help but get wrapped up in it and, you know, you always want to play the devil's advocate. 
there's a few people who you interview in Killer Legends who say, yeah, we knew about the story, but they, they don't particularly know about it. They know the gruesome segment, but they don't know anything else. Was that the general reaction when you were going everywhere? Or you knew the story and you told somebody and they went, yeah, yeah, tell us more. We want the gruesome details. You, you know, that's an interesting idea. People do that. I mean, you know, people love the gruesome details. I mean, it's just you can't get around that. That's that's our inherent nature of to like, because when we learn about the gruesome details of somebody else's case, that kind of takes care of the darkness. It satiates the darkness inside of us. And then we could go off and live our normal lives. But we like to, you know, you know, live through, vicariously live through somebody else's gory details because it allows us to, you know, exercise those demons, per se. Um, what we were really doing when we were telling people about the case was we were looking for the connection between the truth and the reality. When we made Cropsy about this theoretical boogeyman of our childhood, and we spoke to the, to the people in our neighborhood. They never quite gave us their interpretation of the story. It was never factual. It was always some level of fiction that mm -hmm. they've added to the story. And to me, that's so interesting when what people add fictionally to a story. Because it's, it's a peek into their own mind. And it's a peek into the collective fears of any society. Um, with Cropsy, it was the fact that you know, people feared this uh, mental institution in the middle of their hometown that they knew not much about. You know, with uh, clowns, it's 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 pedophiles. You know, and, you know, and, and the fact that you know this is, you know, there could be a pedophile behind that that happy veneer, and people who are too happy scare us. Uh, you know, with Halloween sadist, it's it's you know going around and collecting candy from children. Guys, children going around collecting candy, you know, there's, there's the, always the idea of, like, don't go to that house. They're weird. They're strange. You know, that's, that's the collective other, the Halloween sadist, the person who wants to hurt children. Uh, and so we were always trying to find what the narrative was in the community. And that's what we found interesting. In Killer Legends, they the ones that you choose kind of also I think most people probably know from the horror films now what was your relationship when you were growing up with horror films because obviously Cropsy is I think is a quite a very scary documentary and so is Killer Legends but were you into the whole horror thing when you were growing up did your parents let you watch them I mean yeah I mean you know Shine, The Shining was the scariest movie I've ever seen and, and, and but you know I was never it's funny, that's one of the reasons why we made Cropsy in the way that we did and, and, and decided to call it a horror documentary was because it was a reaction to the torture porn and the found footage films that were very popular at the time. And again, it was like, okay, guys, this is crazy. You know, this guy torturing Saw, you know, that stuff may be scary, but I think this is really scary. I think what was going on here was really scary. And could you imagine? Because the truth is inherently more scary than, than fiction. Stranger, they say, you know, but I believe scarier, you know, it, with, in the right circumstances. Um, and so, to me, that was the reaction. You know, I liked horror films, but what, the truth always freaked me out more. Like a documentary would always blow my mind way more than some supernatural thing. Yeah, the supernatural is scary, but man, knowing that that shit really happened, that freaks me out more. I want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. When you were first making it, and then as it developed, because obviously you were looking at what was probably a bogeyman, but then it developed into this incredibly scary real-life situation, were you surprised at how quickly it turned once you were starting to look at it? Yeah, I mean, what happened was... I was trying to make a Paradise Lost type of movie, the Joe Berlinger Brusinovsky documentary about the yeah. about the uh, Robin Hood Hills murders, and so I was trying to make more of this kind of courtroom drama with satanic overtones and, and boogeyman overtones. And when we didn't get into the courtroom we decided to go out into the community. And that's when we realized that the community had created their own mythology. And, and it involved 
necrophilia, um, devil worshipping, uh, you know, master serial kills, all with some very serious shades of truth, I might add. You know, and, and then again, you know, as a filmmaker, you know, it's one thing to, to, to talk about the boogeyman, it's another thing to talk about devil worshipping, but how do you show that? How do you prove that to an audience? And I mean, you don't have to prove it, but you have to give them, you know, like, this is the idea of what we're talking about. And the fact that those buildings were still there allowed us to have the embodiment of that fear and use that in the film. And so it was very important, the fact that that was there. To me, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost like Auschwitz, you know, the fact that they, they don't tear it down. And people ask me all the time, how come they don't tear it down? Well, it's interesting because it's landmarked. And so you have a landmarked area uh, that you can't really tear down, but they're abandoned. You can't upkeep them properly because it's just too expensive. And so what happens? Well, they become the, the logical foci for anything bad going on. Rapes, murders, assaults, kids go to place where kids go do drugs, homeless. And then you had the idea, of course, that this idea of deinstitution deinstitutionalization in the 1970s when you let all the mentally ill out into the community because you realized you couldn't warehouse them like that and then a lot of them returned back to the facility because they, they knew no better. There was no follow-up care and everything like that. So it was the perfect storm of horrific social consequences and our own campfire stories that allowed that to happen. I think one of the things that struck me when I first watched it was the letters that obviously Andre Rand was sending to you yeah. Which were, I mean, deeply disturbing. When you kept getting them, w was it unnerving you? How did you feel when these letters would turn up? I, I mean, you know, having been raised on a healthy dose of narrative serial killer films, you always think that the clues are in that letter. I mean, you couldn't help it, you know. And, and you know, it's, it's a little bit, you know, it, it's a little bit egotistical to think, oh, he's. He's going to tell me the clue. He's going to tell me the answer, or I can break him. You know, like like the cops back in the day, they were you know they were too you know looking at it the old school way. But if, but if but if I showed him this, I could break him. And and so you always kind of think that, and you want to think that, and that's what we felt. It, it was completely crazy. Um, it, you know, we wanted very much to figure out where these kids were. You know, they're still out there to this day. I think that's the unnerving thing is that by, by the end of it, the piece that you're trying to finish doesn't actually finish. It's, it's still ongoing, as you've said. Um, and there looks to be no end as well. I mean, how is it now, several years later, after you've finished it? What's the general consensus around it now? In, in a lot of ways, you know, it's, it's, it's a tragic story that still has no end and Andre Rand will probably die, you know, and the question is, you know, did he do, did he do it? You know, I think he did some things. You know, I would love to show. He he he, he sent us letters say, and he indicated that he had never seen the film, but he sent us angry letters saying we missed a lot in the, in the courtroom. So I wanted to go in and show him the movie and film him seeing the movie and what he would do, and use that as the entree to. Uh, see what would happen and to take it to the next level. And there's a lot of stuff in Cropsy that was not thoroughly explored or, or that I couldn't explore in an hour and a half. So there was a lot there's a lot of other interesting things that have happened in Staten Island to make to make some strange connections. Have you ever thought about going back, you know, ten, fifteen years later, much like you said with the West Memphis three documentaries that lend themselves to going back ten years later. I mean I, I certainly feel that it would be nice to go back and just see what's happening. Have you? Has this ever come up? Have you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you know, you, you don't want to go back too quickly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so you have to really, and 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 but there's only so much we covered. So I think we'll go back pretty soon. I think you know, this is a te territory that continues to be explored. Um, <clears throat> the old Willowbrook abandoned mental institution is now the College of Staten Island. So, uh, from one institution to another, of course, and so that's, you know, there's so many interesting things. You know, and I, and I think there's this interesting trend going on that I want to talk about. First of all, your t-shirt. I don't know if the audience can see that. What is that t-shirt? Uh, it is the stack from Hannibal. Nice. Um, 
there's a certain thing that's going on um, with what Ben Wheatley was doing, you know, with what I with, with some of the stuff that I do. This kind of real horror, you know, slightly druid esque, a little bit True Detective, a little bit Ben Wheatley, a little bit Propsy, you know. Have you been noticing that style and that thing happening? I think it's started to come through over the past probably two years or something like that where it has taken a turn for the sinister which we've never seen or we've seen years ago on TV but never as much as in depth, you know, like HBO would do it and they would just say, forget, we'll just go in deep. Yeah, pretty much, you know, a lot of Scandinavian crime, you know, really gruesome stuff, really like... You know, it's almost going back to the 70s a little bit, you know, the idea that, like, Ben Wheatley has restarted the Wicker Man era, you know, and, and, and this kind of devil-worshipping era, and I'm very interested in, in that and, and seeing where that leads, and, you know, that to me is the most exciting thing. I think we're going to get a deluge of devil-worshipping stuff in the next couple of years. We're about to do it, though, aren't we? Everything goes uh, through cycles. Yes, of course. You know, it's the, dru it's the druid devil worshipping. You know, in America, the last time we had it was in the 1980s, you know, with heavy metal music and, and devil worshipping. But it's really more of a 70s druid thing. And so I think we're kind of coming around there. And, and, and you know, that was something that, that interested everybody in Cropsy, which was the devil worshipping, uh, you know, thread and how that really played out in truth. And I was at Fantastic Fest the same time Ben Wheatley was there. With uh, he was the kill list, and then Ty West was there with House of the Devil. So we're all noticing this thing. Yeah. Wow! And uh, have you seen Kill List? Uh, yeah. Okay. F fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. When uh, when I saw it, I was at a preview screen, and Ben Wheatley was there, and the the ending. Not to give it away in case anybody hasn't seen it, but the ending. Everybody in the cinema just went silent, and a woman in front of me went, "Fucking hell!" Totally. And that was it. That's the kind of reaction we get to Cropsy. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, like, and and it's funny because as a filmmaker, you you really have to be confident that that's the right reaction. <laughs> but you know, there's a fucking hell that was shit, and then there's a fucking hell that was good, and you don't really know what you know. When I was making Cropsy and just starting out, I was like. I was like, does that mean it's good? You know, in our test screenings. And, like, so it's when you do these types of films where you, like, just, like, you try and fucking blow the audience away. You know, you just put the, put the pedal down to the metal. You never let up. You keep throwing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, you're like, and that's it. Go. And, and so you, it, it's an interesting idea. You just don't know if it works so well because the reactions are always so, like, stunned silence. <laughs> I mean, what, when you were taking it round, was that the general reaction all the time with Cropsey? Is that everybody was just coming up to you and just going crazy about it? I mean, I think there was the idea. First of all, like you know, we did a lot of screenings, but it really found its it found its home on Netflix. You know, and it was you know, for, it's a discovery movie. You, you know, audiences definitely like a discovery movie. You know, like I had no idea that this crazy frigging thing is out there in the world, you know, and it's like, it's like that, um, but I think so, I think, you know, some people just like kind of blown away, for some it was a little bit more of a, a social justice, you know, did he really do it, and for others it was like, wow, that was completely freaky, and I feel like I need to go take a shower, you know, you know, and that's what we like, you know, um, that's the, that's the world that I want to continue to live in. You know, uh, Killer Legends, you know, that was just more of a little bit of like, hey, do you want to go around like looking at investigating some urban legends? And I totally did. I mean, I, I love the idea that if, if you go back to the 70s and 80s and look at all these movies about babysitters, they're all the same urban legend of the babysitter and the man upstairs over and over and over again. And that's why we cut all that whole story together with all these different things. And, you know, that's just fun. That's just like, hey, guess what? Hollywood is regurgitating the same horrific stories over and over and over again to different generations, and it's really fun if you can see the through line, you know. That, that's what I like. You're talking about Killer Legends, and I've actually only got one final question about it, yeah. and that is, you said it's kind of, it was like a pilot for Killer. Yeah. 
Has there been any word on expanding that into a full season? Because it, it works perfectly, I think, in that every week we would see some sort of new legend where we would go, oh, I remember so-and-so telling me about that 20 years ago. I yeah. mean, I, I think it would work perfectly. Has anybody spoken to you about it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't... You know, uh, again, Hollywood, you know, I, I don't know... I think it'll at some point it'll happen. You know, people have been like, "Hey, wait a second, how come this didn't happen?" So I think it will happen. I think uh, it's a fun thing, and you know, obviously, it just lends itself to keep doing it over and over. And over. And so you know, hopefully, with the right uh, with the right kind of push, we'll see uh, a whole bunch more cases, and they keep happening. You know, that's the that's the fun thing about it. there's new urban legends. You know, and again, when we you know we were we were discussing Slenderman, and we we're like, okay, like. Slender Man's cool, but there's not really a crime that connects it. And then it was like, uh, oh, oh, well, you know, these two girls murder, the, you know, try and kill this other girl, and you know, as proxy s sacrifice to Slender Man, I was like, fuck it, hey, you know, <laughs> that's pretty serious. And then, I mean, would you bring it to other countries as well? You know, you were talking about Ben Wheatley and druids, and you know, we've got quite a bit of history over here in the UK. You know, you're. I look everywhere you turn, you bump into some history. You bump into a murder in in, in, uh, in there. Yeah, I mean, I would I would totally love it. And 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 I, there's a film. There's a guy that you guys have. I forgot his name. He's part of the the group who made Mirage Men. Uh, really great movie, by the way, that you can see on Netflix. And Propsy is on Netflix UK, but I don't think Netflix renewed it. Weirdly enough, I don't think it had enough. I don't know, it's interesting what Netflix does, but um, yeah, I'd love it if everybody checked it out, and you know, there's definitely some room, definitely more room for urban legends, so call me, it's going to make it. So, Cropsy is available in the US on iTunes and Netflix, the same with Killer Legends. Yeah, Hulu, uh, Killer Legends, uh, Hulu, iTunes, uh, uh, Cropsy's on Netflix UK. Uh, both are on Amazon, so you know if you just put it in, you'll find a way to see it. And everybody should see these things, I think. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Many thanks for your time, there, Josh. Thank you. Good talking to you. Thanks. Take care. Bye.